Hey, everybody, we're back with part two on the Knights of the Golden Circle. Thanks to everyone who's contributed to our Patreon page, purchased items in our store, or supported our current sponsor, Parachute Home. Yeah, we're super grateful, and every little bit counts. We just shipped our second-to-last gray Astonishing Legends hat out to loyal listener Justin O'Brien in Pennsylvania. But we have more on order, and they should be here in about two weeks. We're also getting some coffee mugs by popular request. And I'm not sure we'll have them in time for Christmas, but they'll be here soon. And just a quick reminder to those of you listening to our older shows that tout our app, it was held hostage by our last hosting provider when we left them for someone else. Now, but we're hoping we can develop a new one in the future. But until then, find us pretty much anywhere you find podcasts, which obviously you've already done if you're hearing my voice right now. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I don't know how you're getting the podcast. But yeah. yes, anywhere they are downloaded. Well, anyway, we have a lot to cover. So let's get to it. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. It's my damn story, and if they don't believe it, I'm not going to worry about it. Damn it. Pardon my French. Bob Brewer. Join us tonight as we take a look at what may have happened to the treasury the Knights of the Golden Circle amassed for their grand plan, but never had the opportunity to spend. Okay, so just briefly, a lot of people binge listen to the show, so maybe you just finished listening to part one. To recap very briefly, what we did in part one is we talked about their plan to create a geographic region over 2,400 miles in diameter centered around Havana, which would excel in agriculture through the continued use of slavery and expand as much as it could and be its own country separate from the north of the United States, the early north after the Civil War and before, during, and after the Civil War. This requires a lot of financing, and they had saved up a great deal of money for what initially they thought was their cause and then later wound up being the idea of a second civil war. And it wasn't just money that they got, as we said, from Jesse James robbing trains and that sort of thing. It was also wealthy benefactors overseas. There were European interests that had a vested interest as investors, I would say, in quotes, in the idea of the Golden Circle. Well, everyone's looking for more land. Right. It, it, especially uh, Europe, and we had uh, interests who wanted their own area to be able to well, – it's about money and eventually. Yeah, and yeah. trade as exactly. well. So there was, a, there was a lot of money coming in, and the other thing that was happening was that in the south, the Confederates were taking what they needed. They actually took over the New Orleans Mint and took pretty much everything out of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, wouldn't, why wouldn't you? Yeah, sure. why wouldn't you? Take and the pens as well. Yeah, squirrel yeah. that away. So there's a lot of money that has to be hidden because you can't put it in the banks. Again, you have to figure this has to be hidden in a place that cannot be confiscated or known about because any institution, eventually people are going to get at it. Right. And it's very hard to put a figure on it. Oh, and oh, and by the way, that another quick point about that. Gold is gold. It's always worth, you know, precious metals are going to always be worth. <laughs> well, that's, that's, the, that's what the saying is about gold. It's always worth what it's worth. Yeah, exactly. On the market, meaning. Yeah. Exactly. So you don't have the same risk that you have with paper money or as, they, as the Southerners call the northern money, the fiat money. So it's hard to put a figure on it, really. It, it's really hard. And there's not a whole lot of notes about how much money they squirreled away. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and safely say that we're talking probably at least $100 million and possibly much, much more. Would you right. agree with that? Well, I, I believe that uh, probably the most of it, or the thought is, is that the, a lot of it came from stolen U.S. payroll, union payroll, to be specific. Right. So that, of course, they know how much they lost or was stolen at the time. But there's a lot of different sources for this money as well. Not only initiation fees from various individuals, donations, which went unmarked. Dark money. Right? Exactly. Un unrecorded. So it's really, yeah, it is really hard to tell what is the vast amount of it in dollars then. Also, how much is it worth now? I thought it would be fun to take a look at one particular instance that supposedly transpired between the KGC and the Emperor Maximilian I of Mexico. And it's kind of a crazy story. Even just what's on uh, in the books as what's known happening with Maximiliano. Yes. But what supposedly may have happened. 
Yeah, it's 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 pretty fascinating. And now a good portion of this comes from Jesse James was one of his names, which we've mentioned earlier and that we actually have a copy of. It's a very hard to find book. I think. Uh, written by Del Schrader. Del Schrader yeah. and Jesse James the mm-hmm. third, also known as Orvis Lee Hoke or Hawk, H O U K or H O W K, excuse mm-hmm. me. And who says that J. Frank Dalton was really Jesse James, which you can that's a whole nother yeah, <laughs> thing in its own, in itself. But there are people that do believe that J. Frank Dalton was Jesse James, and Orvis said that at, at, he said at varying times that J. Frank Dalton was his grandfather, and at another time that he was an, a great uncle, that he was a nephew of him. So there was a whole big claim about Dalton being Jesse James towards the end of his life. He's been dead for some time now, and in fact, Orvis or Jesse James the third has been dead for a while. And a lot of people think it might be true, and we're going to come back to that later. I guess my overall point being that the book. Jesse James was one of his names, although it is very sought after and very rare and whatever, $500 a copy these days. It's a little bit loosey-goosey. It's got typos, grammatical <laughs> errors. There's a, there's a lot of information in it that seems to stretch the limits of – Credibility. Well, it fits the whole folk tale element, you know, where it's just it sounds like your old grandfather telling you a tale and maybe getting a lot of it right, but maybe missing a few details here and there. But it's a great story. Yeah, and that comes back to the construction of the KGC and how they operate, because their whole thing is misinformation and obfuscation and double entendre and never really saying exactly what you mean. They speak in code even to each other, and as a result. If you can imagine a man coming along like J. Frank Dalton, who's in his late 90s, trying to relay what they went through or explain how things worked, and he's working off a basis of knowledge that is very hard to understand. It's almost another language. And, and some of the things that were have borne out in, in people who have researched Orvis or Jesse James III's papers after he passed away, there was a lot of information in his personal material that confirmed – that he actually believed things were happening in terms of treasure and robberies and all that kind of stuff because it was in his personal paperwork. It wasn't that he was sitting down and making up a story. Right. Or at least he didn't seem to think that he was. However, had he been told stories that weren't true? Probably. Had he been told stories that were true? Probably also. You know, so it's – Well, that's the problem. It gets really cloudy. Exactly. And that's the problem with – that kind of a setup to keep things secret is that you're telling information that is true to your compatriots and to outsiders. And you're also telling things that aren't true. And those get confused after 100 years or more. Yeah, exactly. Especially when, you know, everybody else is dead. There's not like, it's not like you can have a panel and ask people questions who are lucid about the history of such a large and complex organization and a, and a complex time in American history. Right. And this is information is passed down generation to generation to those being brought up with this tradition. But they may not have the correct information. And a lot of it gets forgotten. People pass away. Yeah. And it gets it, lost. It's primarily primarily oral, and they don't keep written records. They go out of their way not to keep written records. So there, I think there's that's one of the reasons that the book is a little bit crazy. I don't necessarily believe everything I read in the book, but we do want to talk about Maximilian and who I was not aware of. I guess it got overlooked when I was studying history in high school and college. <laughs> yeah. He ends up as kind of a footnote, but he had an important role. And what happened with him in Mexico happened concurrently with the Civil War, which I think is a lot of reasons why you don't hear about it, at least in America, when you're coming up through the schooling system, you're learning about the Civil War. You're not hearing about this row in Mexico, yeah. which is pretty fascinating. And also one of the things that I'll say before we get fully into it is that I found Emperor Maximilian to be a pretty cool dude. Like, I felt like I would have liked this guy. <laughs> well, no, he was okay. I yeah. think he got caught up in the in the sweep of other people's ambitions of France and Bonaparte the Third. Yes, and his ambition, basically, a European expansionist and imperialist ambition. Well, he became kind of a, a little bit of a pawn in this game for imperialism and European expansionism into the Americas. And unfortunately, uh, suffered a, a, ter- a terrible fate. <laughs> but, but so, supposedly, yeah. Well, well let's all right. Again, so, <laughs> yes, let's talk about who he was and what happened. Well, he was his birth name is Ferdinand Maximilian Joseph, and he was the uh, younger brother of, of the Austrian Emperor Francis Joseph the First. So he's part of the Habsburg uh, dynasty, yes. ruling Europe. Yes. So he was, yeah, he was definitely of monarch stock. Yeah, and and relatively young uh, in his late twenties, he was already in charge of the. Navy in yeah, Austria. He was, no, he was right. He was a very smart guy, kind of precocious, played pranks even on the emperor. Yeah. He was part of the line of the Holy Roman emperors. 
And he was very studied. He that was a lot of his youth was spent hours and hours. We're talking like you know into his teens, like fifty hours of study a week, just about the world, geography, politics, diplomacy. And so by the time he's in his twenties, he's very well versed in the worldly ways of the time. And uh, also, he's kind of an adventurous spirit. He loved botany, he loved science. So when he entered military service, as a lot of them do, he was trained in the Austrian Navy and eventually became commander-in-chief of the Austrian Navy, which I guess, you know, the, <laughs> they're mostly landlocked. Right. Well, they are landlocked at, the, <laughs> at this date. Right. But they did have a navy. A couple and, of canoes. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> but he, uh. he was instrumental in, in reorganizing it and uh, reforming it. So that it became more in the consciousness of the nation because they weren't – nobody really considered the Navy at that point. Right. Uh, So he did a lot of stuff when he was younger. So this is not a lazy couch surfing kind of guy. He got a lot of things done and he was clever. So let's talk about the status of Mexico. Well, he was approached in 1859 by a consortium of Mexican – monarchists, meaning those are folks that really don't like uh, the idea of a republic of Mexico. They want a king. They want a monarchy. Right. At the time, they had a president, Benito Juarez. Now, the Habsburg dynasty, and if, if you get into European politics, these ruling families, it, it doesn't really matter what, what countries they were originally from or their nationalities of birth, because he was Austrian. But monarchists and elite ruling families of Mexico wanted a king because again that establishes more power you don't have to vote for him he <laughs> just he's just king so they're putting forth this idea that like hey you're not doing much of anything other than you know running the navy for austria why don't you come over here yeah we we'll like put you. your power come exactly. be come be the king or the emperor of mexico well he, he that was the first time he was approached right yeah that right and and so he's not very interested at this point he kind of turned them down there was a nobleman Jose Pablo Martinez del Rio, and he came with a proposal to become the emperor of Mexico. And he and their family had ruled the viceroyalty of New Spain before Mexico gained its independence from Spain. So again, he seems legitimate. And that's the other thing that monarchists, they want to make sure, I mean, there's legal gray areas, of course, of who's really entitled to be king or emperor of a territory or nation. But he seemed fitting for this. Right. So the first invitation actually came from within Mexico. However, there were other mitigating circumstances that led to his own people pushing him that way because Juarez had borrowed money from France, Spain, and Britain. Right. A lot of money, which <laughs> which we've read in, in various forums and some other places was actually loaned by the Rothschilds most likely. That's a whole other thing if you're yeah. all into the Illuminati and all that. <laughs> yes. Uh, We're not going down that road right, right now. But uh, this money was loaned to the country of Mexico, and Juarez had stalled on the payments. He had defaulted on the payments. This is the point at which Napoleon III uses the default on the debt as a motivator to convince Spain and Britain to come with France and go into Mexico and get the money. Essentially, yeah. <laughs> they, they, well, he, he on gangster terms are going to yeah. uh, break some legs here. So they amassed French troops right. with the backing of the other two countries, and they went to Veracruz and entered the country with the intent of taking over the country. What the British didn't know was that Napoleon the Third had grander designs. He really wanted to make Mexico a French territory. Right. He he basically just wasn't satisfied with repayment of the loan or even getting the interest. He wanted, you know, he well, his uncle, you know, taking over large swaths of Europe. He wanted the same thing. That's how these folks think. And so at the invitation of Napoleon III, now Maximilian starts to think like, well, maybe this is a viable idea. He wasn't really interested at first. He was, he was approached again. This is after almost two years of fighting between the French and Juarez's guerrilla troops. Right. The first time he's approached is 1859. So then in October of 1861, he gets another letter from Gutierrez de Estrada asking him to take the Mexican throne. He instead takes a, a boat trip to Brazil to study botany in the rainforest because he's very interested in botany and science and uh, new technology. But as things are happening now, Napoleon III entreats him again to, hey, consider this offer. But some things are happening on the political and military front in Mexico. General Foray captures Mexico City, and then there is a plebiscite, or it's a referendum saying... No, no, we've taken a vote. Everything's cool. The Mexican people are really welcoming you to become their new king. 
which was not exactly true. The referendum was strong-armed by French troops there at the time. Yeah. So it wasn't an accurate depiction of them welcoming him. This is the leader you're looking for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so he gets shafted a little. And then the other thing he didn't realize, right before he leaves to sail to Mexico to take up this offer, he has to give up all of his noble rights of Europe. So he's like, well, wait, wait a minute, I have, to give, I have to give this up? Well, no, if you're going to become the emperor of Mexico, you can't continue to be part of the ruling dynasty of Europe. So yes. that's another thing that was kind of the rug was pulled out from under him. As you can see, he starts to get the feeling this might be a puppet regime, which it was. So once he gets to Mexico, though, things don't exactly go swimmingly. There's still fighting going on. Benito Juarez, although he is no longer technically the president, or maybe he is, but he's not in power, he has guerrilla troops that are loyal to him all over the country. And they're still fighting the French, even while they're trying to put Maxi in his position (laughs) as the king. Yeah, we'll see. Or uh, emperor, excuse me. Right. President Juarez of the Republic of Mexico was kind of a liberal ruler. He was he was liked mostly by the people. Now, this is the irony, though, is that Maximilian, uh, his tendencies were also kind of liberal as far as reforming uh, work hours for people and, and fair pay and things like that. But they didn't see it that way. When he landed in Veracruz, he was not very warmly welcomed. So right. already this guy's an Austrian. He's going to come here and tell us what to do. That's kind of how they perceived him. However, now the French militarily were winning battles, and they were, oh, you know what Americans know about? Cinco de Mayo. That's that's right. (laughs) The Battle of Puebla uh, also happens. It's a small victory, and as we were discussing before— For Juarez's guerrillas, not for the French. Yeah, it's not very widely celebrated in Mexico because it's a small battle, and of course— Yeah, it wasn't the war. It wasn't the war with France. It was one battle— with France to restore Juarez to the presidency. They won that battle. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what Cinco de Mayo is. And they lost it again <laughs> a couple, yeah. uh, some time later. Yeah. The, the battle takes place again, and this time they lose. Yeah. However, it's a great excuse for American companies to sell beer, yeah. which we enjoy drinking <laughs> on, on the 5th of May. Yes. So that's where that comes from. But yes. And tasty Mexican. Oh, well, there you go. So, <laughs> but what's happening is that there's a lot of skirmishes here and there. Then on May 31st of 1863, President Juarez flees the city with his camp cabinet, and then he retreats northward to Paseo del Norte, and then later on to Chihuahua. They take the treasury, and then basically they're a government in exile, even until 1867. So the fighting continues, and eventually it it becomes very clear that Maximilian is in danger. Yes. He has some loyal generals that are still continuing to fight for him, who kind of convince him, well, you know what, we'll, we'll amass more troops, hang in there. Because he's encouraged to flee at this point. Yes. Even Napoleon III saying, you better get out of there, buddy. It's not looking good. Yeah. Now, the United States during this time is remaining as neutral as possible. It's now it's going to be 1866, and wars has fought back so effectively that Napoleon pulled out facing defeat. And, and, and also he was getting to a point where he was having concern about Franco-American relations because it didn't seem like the best idea to continue to pursue this poorly conceived plan. Well, yeah. And in the American point of view, they really weren't comfortable with a king just south of their borders here because they just got away from that. Exactly. In in 1776 and 1812. So they're of the mind that this is not a good development. I mean, they want stability. And again, Maximilian seems like a nice guy, but they, I think they'd rather have a republic to the south. So now we come back to Jesse James as one of his names and the Knights of the Golden Circle and how this all ties together. Because you're one, you may be wondering, what does this have to do with that? Well, well it gets a little crazy and folklorish here. Yes, it does. <laughs> now, so according to the book, Jesse James is one of his names by Del Schrader and Jesse James the Third, or Orvis Lee Hawk, the Confederates reached out to Maximilian and said, let's help you. You can help us and we'll help you. We can see that you're in trouble. Max had a great treasure, as all emperors do. He had he had Habsburg heirlooms with him. He had wealth from running the country and... O- uh, old money, as they old say. Old money, yes, yeah. as they say. Now, according to Del Schrader, and Jesse James is one of his names, General Shelby took 2,000 cavalry men and a full regiment of Confederate-led Red Bone Indians down to the Rio Grande to try and save Max's dying regime while Max's wife, Empress Carlotta, was pleading his case back in France. She had gone overseas. She, they got her out of there. But the problem with these troops that are down on the Rio Grande is that they're in awful shape. They are tired. They're sick. They have dysentery. They have all kinds of problems. On top of that, they're being sniped at by troops loyal to Juarez. And there's also French troops still in the area that apparently are attacking them as well. Okay. <laughs> He's nice. So they're having a bad time. Yeah. So now 
when you think about Max, he's he's only 35 years old at this point. He's still a relatively young man. Schrader says, and Jesse James was one of his names, that the KGC held an emergency secret meeting in Oak Grove, Louisiana, to come up with a rescue plan for Maximilian. At this meeting, William Clark Quantrill, who we mentioned in part one, who's one of the primary leaders inside the Knights of the Golden Circle and also famously was the Quantrill of Quantrill's Raiders, made a stirring speech asking for 100 of the best men the KGC could offer to go down and turn the rivers of Mexico to blood if need be. They rounded these guys up, which he wound up saying, I think, something to the effect of these are the bravest men that were ever assembled to go down and help these troops. And these were obviously it's – it's not a very big force, but strategically they are capable of helping larger operations succeed. So they go in small groups down there. By the way, at this point, Jesse Woodson James, who supposedly is J. Frank Dalton, is about 23 years old. And they arrange a meeting between Jesse Woodson James and Emperor Maximilian. And the KGC position in that meeting is that Maximilian needs to abdicate or he's going to be executed. He needs to get out of there. According to the book, Max didn't want to abdicate. He didn't want to see the, the, the generals and the, the other parts of his court that were loyal to him executed. He, he had a, a great deal of pride, and he seemed like a, a, a brave man, right. I should say. So he was not interested in abdicating. But one of the things that he said to Jesse— uh, in this meeting, this secret meeting, is that he had a great treasure, which is what we mentioned before. He had House of Habsburg jewels and heirlooms. But more importantly, he told Jesse that the Aztecs in Mexico knew where a large treasure cache was located. Now, this may sound familiar to you if you listen to the Oak Island series from us. <laughs> yeah. There was a huge Aztec treasure that Drake was hell-bent on taking, the conquistador. And when he left to go and kind of get things organized to come back and take it, when he came back, it was gone. From what I remember when we were doing the Oak Island show, the Aztecs had been warned by some priests who'd stay behind that you need to get this stuff out of here because this guy, when he comes back, he's going to take it. So it disappeared. There are some people that theorize that that's what's buried at Oak Island. Let's say it's not at Oak Island. It has to be somewhere. It still remains undiscovered to this day, as far as we know. Apparently, Maximilian knows the Aztecs that know where that horde is, and he's relaying this information to Jesse James. Mm. If you believe any of this, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, so, I think if, uh, if this is also touched upon in National Treasure Part Two. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. I, which I haven't seen, but yeah, that's I saw it when it first came out. That was years ago, but yeah, well, you know, Bob Brewer, who we'll be discussing later, was a consultant on that film. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. Right. At this point, the KGC is still thinking that they need to fund a second civil war. So Max is saying, if you can help me. I can make a huge donation. I can help you. I can help your cause, especially to keep all this gold out of what he called Juarez's bloody peons. That's a quote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. From I don't know who was at that meeting that was quoting. <laughs> all right. But so Jesse says, look, you, you need to get out of here. You're going to die. You cannot stay here. And Max just won't leave. So Jesse rides back north and trying to figure out how they're going to deal with this and how, how they can help. About a half day after he has left Maximilian, he finds out that Max has been tricked into coming out. He's court-martialed, and Juarez has him executed, along with two of his generals, on June 19th of 1867. Well, there was some bad blood there, literally, because Maximilian, for all his liberal policies, had issued what they called the Black Decree, which meant that if you had some affiliation with Juarez and uh, and trying to overthrow his monarchy there, you were immediately put to death. And a lot of high-ranking generals and officers and regular folks were summarily executed. So they didn't forget that. That's right. They were pretty. They were pretty ticked off about that. And this was in spite of the fact that leaders all over the world were sending messages to Juarez saying, "Please don't kill Maximilian. He's an emperor. He's a royal." Do not execute him. Well, but, even even the yeah, even the eminent liberals, as they say, uh, the the author Victor Hugo and Giuseppe Garibaldi sent in telegrams and letters saying that yeah, he's not, he's not a bad guy really, and actually Benito Juarez kind of liked him personally, but he could not forgive the fact that. A lot of his loyal troops were killed. A few of his generals were killed. Also, he wanted to send a message to Europe. Don't try this again. We're not going to stand for it. Yeah, we're not going to accept imperialism. Exactly. Yeah. So Max is shot. By a firing squad. Yeah, by firing squad, using some kind of antiquated weapon. I can't remember what it was now, but it's it's definitely a painful way to go. Well, military weapons. Don't make a mess of it, right? What is that? <laughs> That's um, Breaker Morant. Breaker Morant. Yeah. Great. Yeah. That's a movie, by the way. So Schrader's book goes on to say 
that Jesse James received a coded message from Quantrill, this is a few weeks later, telling him that he urgently needed to come to Livingston, Texas, and he must bring a doctor, and that it was urgent. So Jesse gets his older brother, Frank, who was a Confederate surgeon, Frank James, and goes thinking that Quantrill is probably wounded. They used to get there a Confederate underground system called the Hoot Owls Trail System to get there. This is kind of like the Underground Railroad, but obviously the, op- the opposite. <laughs> the opposite, right. <laughs> the so other like, Yeah, that it had food, shelter, and fresh horses every 30 to 40 miles. So when they get there, they go into this territory that is dominated by the Alabama Cushata Indians. Mm-hmm. And it's called I think it's called the Big Thicket. And and by the way, that's one of the typos in the book. And Jesse James yeah. is one of his names. It doesn't say Cushata. It says Cushatata. And uh, uh, it's a typo. It's not yeah. correct. So I don't, you know, again, who knows why that's there? Maybe everything's Could be a mistake. Made up. Could Maybe be purposefully. It's, yeah. It's a good point. Yeah. They go into this area and an Indian actually takes them to a barn. And inside this barn, they see, Jesse sees, a wounded, emaciated shadow of his former self, Emperor Maximilian. Wow. Still alive. With that crazy beard that, yeah. that goes in two different directions. Yeah, and the in the end, I guess a medicine man had been taking care of him. They described him as having been more dead than alive for quite some time, and although he was now awake and cognizant and able to talk. So Max tells Jesse in this secret meeting in Texas, after he supposedly was executed, he says, I was on the ground. There was a wagon that was going to take my body and the body of my two generals to a mass grave, and they were reading Last Rites. And one of the Red Bone Indians who was loyal to me noticed that I was alive. So they quickly went over to Juarez's men and said, this man was an emperor. He deserves his own grave. Let us take him and bury him in a befitting way. Juarez's men supposedly agree to this. They take Maximilian away from there, and then they secret him out of the country and start trying to nurse him back to health. It sounds improbable, but you know what? I think stranger things have happened with it, people being shot and yeah. surviving. It, so, it reminds yeah. you of uh, of the story of Anastasia Romanov, oh, yeah. and the and when the Romanov family was executed, the, you know there were all these rumors that she lived, yeah. and including there was an old lady I can't remember her name now who said that she was Anastasia. Oh Romanoff. yes, right. They compared ear shapes and all that. That family was brutally hacked up and thrown into a mine shaft. That's right. And Anastasia, they they recently proved I can't remember in the in the early two thousands they did DNA tests on their remains and conclusively proved that she had died with the family. Ah, there you go. So th- that that story wasn't true. So right. You know, it's a long shot, this this whole idea. <laughs> no, but what we're saying is that, I mean, there, there's been mobsters who have been shot in the head yes. m- multiple times and survived. Right. You know, but here, yes, it's a military firing squad, so you're, you're taking a couple of rounds to the chest. And it's very, very unlikely in my view, but I'm, I can't say it's impossible. Well, anyway, Dr. Frank has got to determine what he needs to do to get Max healthy again. So apparently they dam up this little stream. They're instructing him to swim in it regularly. They keep his <laughs> wounds clean. Yeah, yeah, therapeutic. Yeah, therapeutic. And they're stitching up his wounds and cleaning them out. And he's doing the stuff that it goes the next step past what the medicine man had been doing and to help get him all the way back to his health. According to Jesse James, Max was incredibly remorseful for his actions specifically relating to the Black Decree. Yeah. It, not just that, but any other time that he had ordered men killed and all that, he had, he had come so close to death that he had a newfound respect for life and he was turning over a new leaf, basically. <laughs> and the other thing was he was terribly in love with Empress Carlotta and he was very much worried about her, who he hadn't seen since the whole thing went down and she had gone back, back to France to, you know, to plead their case. Yeah, you got to realize he wasn't getting a lot of support. He wasn't, I believe, the United States at the time, Britain... And Spain did not recognize his rule right? because they saw it as a puppet regime. Exactly. And so she goes back to plead his case, gather support amongst the powerful and the wealthy. But she does not suffer a good fate because after she hears that he's been shot, she kind of falls into a maddening depression and is declared insane. Yes. She she loses her mind. He's worried about her. And so what he's deciding is that for the sake of her – and he doesn't know that, by the way, according to Jesse James at this point – What he wants to do is he wants to turn himself in for the sake of his wife. Jesse James says, absolutely not. You are legally dead and you're going to stay that way. It's a gift. And he says, we, meaning the KGC, the Knights of the Golden Circle, are going to find Carlotta and bring her to you. Your name is now John Maxey. And that's what it'll be (laughs) from here on out. And we're going to recover your treasure as well. 
from Mexico. So Jesse organizes all these groups. They go down and they are actually recovering all of Maximilian's treasure and bringing it into Texas and burying it in strategic locations in what you might call caches. And we're going to come back to all of that yeah. again. Then Jesse starts to try to figure out where Carlotta is, Empress Carlotta. And at that point, he finds out and hears that she's lost her mind. But he decides not to tell Maximilian that. He comes up with a plan. He tells Maximilian, we're going to line our pockets with your gold. We're going to go overseas, me and John Trammell. And at the time, according to Jesse James as one of his names, the book, there was a $50,000 price on Jesse's head from the Rothschilds, and there was a $25,000 price on Trammell's head. So they were going right into the thick of it. Yeah. And Trammell, interesting enough, Trammell was black. So he, according to an article we found in the Chicago Tribune, he actually was written out of Western history for a very long time. So there's a lot of stuff that you'll read about the James gang, but you won't see Trammell in there. And Trammell cooked for them for 20 years. He also participated in train robberies and supposedly was a co-conspirator in the Charlie Bigelow killing where they used Charlie's body as a double to say that Jesse had been shot. Uh Uh-huh. It's a whole other thing. Okay, so they, they go overseas, and they, they've got a plan. Their plan is to replace Carlotta with a lookalike, which this is something that comes up a whole lot in KGC history and also in the history of Jesse James and the history of the West. Uh, it comes up with, I believe, Billy the Kid. It comes up with Jesse James and his death and the where he killed his rival, Charlie Bigelow, and they put Charlie Bigelow in his place to make it seem like Jesse James was dead. They're, they're all about doubles because back then there's no internet. There's no – there's hardly even cameras. There's not a lot of images of people going around. There's only descriptions really. Exactly. And as we mentioned before, it's easy to do. I don't know if it's easy, but it's possible. Right. It's, and it's – I believe it's happened throughout history quite a bit because people don't know what people look like for real. So they find this woman that looks like Empress Carlotta. They replace Carlotta with the double. They take her out, and then they come back across the ocean with Carlotta dressed as a chambermaid for the wealthy businessman that Jesse is playing, along with his um, compadre, John Trammell, as they return, I'm sure, first class on some vessel. They come back to the U.S., and Carlotta and Maximilian are reunited in Texas, if you believe that he wasn't shot in Mexico. (laughs) (laughs) Or he was shot, but he got better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm feeling much better. So now, out of gratitude— to Jesse for what he had done. Maxi makes good on his promise to help the Knights of the Golden Circle and their cause for the Second Civil War. He pledges a donation of $12.5 million to be paid out over a few years to the Knights of the Golden Circle. And he says to Jesse, I want you to take $5 million personally. Yeah, realize these are incredible sums, which kind of, again, makes me question the story a little bit, because in today's terms, it would be massive. Yes, and critics of Jesse James was one of his names. Talk about how Schrader and Jesse James III, the language is very flowery. It's always millions of dollars here and there, and what a great rogue hero Jesse was. And so there's some question as to how much fiction they're injecting into the story is the whole story fiction or are they just embellishing it for effect because they see this man as this kind of hero of of the south and the confederacy and the knights of the golden circle because according to not just jesse james is one of his names but shadow of the sentinel the other book we've been referencing in part one and also will be tonight and other sources jesse was the treasurer and comptroller of the kgc's entire cash of money. Well, a pretty big responsibility for a young man. Exactly. So it's, there's, a, there's a lot to consider there. But so $12.5 million for the KGC, $5 million for Jesse. And Schrader quotes Jesse James III as saying, Maximilian's treasure set Grandpa up in business, making him a millionaire five times over at age 23. I don't say that Grandpa never robbed a bank nor a train, but he didn't do it for chicken feed and he didn't do it for personal gain. He was a very rich man. When he robbed or hijacked, he was trying to fill a long list of Confederate depositories preparing for the Second Civil War, which never came. Right. And it's a good point uh, that we brought up in part one is that he never displayed any personal wealth. Right, exactly. He was definitely not driving around in Ferraris. <laughs> Horse dr- horse-drawn Ferraris. Yeah. But that goes to the theme that we'll see also in Bob Brewer's book in that These families that have been protecting these caches of immense wealth for generations never displayed any personal wealth. These people are living at the poverty line, yet they're guarding 
these tremendous caches of gold coins, bars, weapons, whatever it is. Right. Never spending, you know, other than you know, taking a little, a little bit here and there. Payroll. Needed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but there you go. So that's the legend is that he's this fabulous bank robber that never seemed to have a dime. Yeah. Outwardly. And now Orvis Lee Hawk, Jesse James III, at varying times he had claimed that J. Frank Dalton was his grandfather and other times that he was his uncle or great uncle. And you have to keep in mind – Jesse James III was a bit of an opportunist. When J. Frank Dalton was getting older, he had, was parading him around and charging people to see him. So <laughs> there's there's some debate as yeah. to what's really going on there. Now, with respect to his confusion about his own lineage, Jesse James III, that is, other people suggest that he might be confused by his own past. Because if you consider this series of events, there's an entire additional dimension to this, where that Jesse James was a very important figure in the Knights of the Golden Circle, and he was also an outlaw. It could be that when he had family, when he had descendants, they were intentionally protected from their own lineage, moved to foster homes or raised by other people loyal to the cause with different names, different information to protect them from any repercussions that might be associated with the apprehension of James, because James had grown up seeing things happen to his own mom. His mother, Zerelda James, lost her arm when the Pinkertons threw a bomb into the house that they were in, because they thought that Frank and Jesse were in there. And she picked wow. the bomb up, threw it into the fireplace, and it blew up while she was throwing it. But she probably still saved the other people in the household. Yeah. Her eight-year-old son, Archie, was killed, though, that day. And it, it, yeah. it put a, it cast a really bad light on the Pinkertons for... Their actions. Well, they, they they had a lot of strong arm tactics. Not to you know, the pun not intended here, but uh, you have to realize they're at war. This is like a covert and above ground war that's happening between people that think that there are treasonous actions going on and bounties and outlaws, and it's the wild west. Now, in addition to all of this, there is also a woman that I had eventually wanted to do a show on named Betty Dorset Duke, who says that her great grandfather James L. Courtney was the real Jesse James. Ah. She has family pictures that clearly show, among other folks that are common and known to be related to Jesse James, they show a woman that is the spitting image of Zerelda. She's got the exact same dress that yeah. Zerelda is wearing in a famous picture that has a pattern on it that I think it's a certain flower that she's particular to, carnation mm -hmm. or something like that. So these photos have been forensically analyzed by a company that used to be called the Visionix Corporation. It's now known as Identix, I believe, and also the forensic department at the police department in Austin, Texas. And they confirm that this is definitely Zerelda in her pictures. So this would say that Betty Dorset Duke is definitely related to Jesse James, but she's saying that James L. Courtney was Jesse James. So then who was J. Frank Dalton? Well, one of the other things that Jesse James was one of his names talks about is that there were two Jesse Jameses. Z -z -z. <laughs> right. And both of them had brothers named Frank. Ah, yes. And right. so, yeah. and they were all cousins. And uh. so there's this, it's a much more complex situation. Now, so the next question you ask yourself is, well, if J. Frank Dalton was actually Jesse James, if he didn't in fact die at the hands of Bob Ford. Who, who was now, you got to consider complicit in this. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Exactly. Bob Ford was immediately pardoned after supposedly shooting Jesse in the back of the head, which he might have been anyway because he was an outlaw, but yeah. Ford also had KGC connections. Right, right. So we're coming around to a bigger picture here, and then so you have to wonder, James L. Courtney and J. Frank Dalton might have been cousins, or yeah. one of them might be lying, or both of them might be lying, or Jesse might have been shot by Bob Ford. It's just there's a, there's just a big complicated picture, and you just have to you, – all this stuff is going through your head when you're figuring it out. But there is no question, as you will see moving forward in this episode, that somebody with the initials JJ yeah. hid gold very effectively all over the country. Yeah. I, I think that's what you can take away from this is that the folks involved are bathed in secrecy, brought up in secrecy and diversion and obfuscation, and they may not even know who's connected. But what we can see that's that's proven with documents and actual artifacts is that the connections were real, no yes. matter who the, the connecting point people were. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Uh, the organizations were real. The evidence that pops up seems to be real. Yes. It seems and, to point to a real conspiracy. Yes. And let's talk, let, let's actually talk about conspiracies a little bit, because there's some people, it's just a red flag. They hear the word conspiracy, and they, oh, this is all a load of hooey, whatever. This is, this can't be true. And in some cases, that's probably the case with, because yeah. uh, there, it, 
it does give itself over to people who have sort of a paranoid sense want to believe that conspiracies are happening that aren't happening. Just taking a quick look at the Wikipedia page, we don't go to Wikipedia all the time, and in fact, not very much anymore, yeah. but... It's a good place to start sometimes when yes. you just want to get some bearings of what, again, the general... <laughs> very general. Is, very general thinking is... And often that, skewed. Yeah, yeah, it's a little debunky, but, you know, you want to know what's the mainstream thinking out there. That's academically. right. Academically. Yes, and it, with, re, with regard to conspiracy, if you go to the entry on conspiracy, there are two experts on there that they cite as having having come up with different types of them. The one that I was most impressed with was a political science professor emeritus Michael Barkin of Syracuse University. He breaks them down into three different types. Number one, event conspiracy theories. Examples of this might be uh, the assassination of JFK, 9-11, uh, AIDS being a controlled release to attack the black community, that sort of thing. Two, systemic conspiracy theories. This is something that has more broad goals, like securing the control of a country. This is the category that the Knights of the Golden Circle would fall under. Three, super conspiracy theories. This is multiple conspiracies that are linked together. This is right up there with like the Illuminati or the, the stuff that Milton William Cooper wrote about in Behold a Pale Horse, which I'm sure some of our listeners are familiar with that book. That's – Again, a whole nother episode. <laughs> <laughs> Which we've had people write in saying, like, where are these episodes? Uh, yeah, we, <laughs> can, only, are, we can, can only actually, do so much. Yeah, you're actually writing these down. We do write yeah. them down. Exactly. We, we do. It's just a question of needing, um, I don't know, a thousand years. Yeah. 14, 25, 26 shows a year. <laughs> and, and, and time in between to flush them all out. Yeah. Uh, but yes, you're right. And yes, I think the overarching idea here, though, is that it's all about Control. Power, money, control. And the other thing to consider when you think about this is that a lot of people just dismiss conspiracy ideas as being bunk in every case. But there's a good list of conspiracies that have proven to be true. I've, kind of everyone's seen that. There's, there's, some, there's one online I think that Cracked made a few years ago that keeps, uh, pops up on Reddit every other day, <laughs> conspiracies that prove to be true. One of yeah. them was that the, the U.S. government actually tested chemical weapons on civilians. Oh, well, you know, there's a – NPR did a story about uh, American troops having chemical weapons tested on themselves and, as, and volunteered – I mean, for testing. I don't think they realized the effects of it. Yeah. Uh, but these – some of these guys are still alive and they never got any kind of recompense other than a, 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 a commendation medal maybe for participating. But, of course, they were being tested with mustard gas. I mean, not, not being killed dead, but certainly getting bad rashes and having health problems for the rest of their life. Yeah. So yeah. that's, again, these are, you may think that that's, that doesn't happen, but in the advancement of a cause, like winning World War II, the government interests, the military will sometimes kind of dip into those things to see what happens. Yes. And then, the, the, in fact, they're, they're, I mean, this is pretty well known, but the, the government also secretly infected 200-plus uh, African-American men with syphilis yes. to watch the effects. Yeah, it's pretty horrible because the, the effects are just devastating. Yeah, and they had uh, sexual partners and didn't know that they were infected, so the whole thing spread. It's, yeah. it's just – it's insane. And, you know, then, and occasionally, again, these things happen, and in, in that case where it's, uh, it's experimentation it, for whatever flimsy medical or, or genuine medical reason, that's done for a larger cause – but a lot of what we're talking about here, though, is political power of a right. sense. If you get all the way to the super conspiracy of the Illuminati, well, what's that about? Control of the earth you know, yeah. the, and the population of the earth. Right. Uh, and if you look at the Knights of the Golden Circle, it's, it's control over their own interests, which were financial, territory, and slaveholding. The, the bottom line is we know that they do happen. They can happen. We know that the Knights of the Golden Circle is confirmed to exist. What was never really clear was what their s true scope and power was or how much money they necessarily had behind them. But we, we've established that they were there. So now getting back to Maximilian, that, that story sounds so apocryphal. It's, it is hard to believe. But even if that story isn't true, there are numerous other sources of income for this organization, as we've made clear, between foreign investors and the idea of the Golden Circle, money that they've stolen from the North, essentially, from the payrolls, as we mentioned with bank robbers, especially if you've got two sets of Jesse and Frank Jameses out there. <laughs> attacking, multiplying their efforts. Yeah, yeah, attacking every train that has a federal payroll on it. The, the one big cash that we will come to later – was supposedly Jesse's own money closing uh, in on half a million dollars that he stole off a train yeah. and then filed an insurance claim <laughs> for the half <laughs> million dollars and doubled yeah. his money. And in the process, the man who owned the insurance company was an ex-union 
general. So he got to screw that guy as well and then <laughs> yeah. double his money by stealing yeah. his own money off a train. Well, wow, kind of modern. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I think what you're, what you're getting at here is that we're trying to paint a picture of the scope of the possible buried treasures around the entire country. Because I, I think you have a mind to think of it's just the South. And, and I guess, oh, I wanted to point out something as well. Everyone in the South was not pro-slavery. There were, of course, people who fought on the side of the Union who lived in the South. Yes. And uh, we, we had one uh, uh, listener uh, make a comment. But basically, yes, we're not, we're not trying to paint a huge brush over everybody that is – there's a very clear dividing line, the Mason-Dixon line, uh, where you believe one thing or the other. Yeah, we're, because, not, we're not making broad generalizations here. And in fact, I'm from the South. I mean, although yeah. I was born basically in Death Valley, but yeah. I, I grew up in North Carolina. So yeah, we're certainly not saying that, and anyone who's misconstruing that, it's you're you're not hearing our message exactly. Yeah. And the other the the flip side of that is that there were a lot of sympathizers for pro slavery interests in the north exactly, and they're they're contributing money. And ultimately, yeah. it's a gray area when you study history in high school, or at least when we did. I'm, things are more accurate now, I believe, but. It, Things were taught to us as very black and white. It was, yeah. you know, it's this way or it's that way. But the truth is, there there weren't borders. It was it was gray everywhere. You had sympathizers and you had secessionists and people and abolitionists living side by side. And that's why it was a civil war, brothers against brothers. Right. And yeah. the territories west and even into California, which entered the Union as a free state, had a ton of sympathizers with the KGC cause, as we'll show a little bit later here. Again, what we're trying to show here is that it's not just a few jars of coins, although those have been found. We, it, this could possibly be a massive, massive amount of treasure buried not just in the south, but from the southeast all the way to the west, California, all the way to the north, all over the place. You know what? You sent me an article this morning from the Los Angeles Times, and in 2013, just two years ago, this couple stumbled across a rusty lid peeking out of some moss on their property. What, Northern they, California. Yeah, couple. Northern California, yeah. yeah. So upon further inspection, they discovered what is currently being touted as the most valuable treasure cache ever found in North America with a current market value in excess of $10 million. Yeah. Now, my favorite thing about this story was that the quote from the man, and they just go by John and Mary. Their last names, uh, understandably, are not mentioned in the article, but the, the article was written in, a, in March 2014. Sorry, they, they found it in 2013, but the article was written in March 2014 by Samantha Schaefer for the Los Angeles Times. John, the husband, said, and, and I quote, when, when they found it, he said, I looked over my shoulder to see if someone was looking at me. I had the idea of someone on horseback in my head. It's impossible to describe, really, the strange reality of that moment. What I love about this <laughs> is, I mean, was the ghost of a sentinel watching him remove that money? Ace. Because we're going to come back to the men on horseback, and we talked about them in the first one, but we're really going to talk about them here coming up. Yeah. They took their jobs very seriously. Passed down from generation to generation. Because you, easily, if you could figure this out, you would just like, well, I'm just going to take the cash that was left here 80 years ago, 100 years ago, and uh, carefully spend it. Yes. But none of them have seemed to do that. Or maybe they did and didn't tell anybody. And I believe occasionally, as you'll see with Bob Brewer's family and Grandpa Ashcraft, if they need a little bit of money, they might take a few, a few coins here and there. But certainly not lavish spending. Yes. Anyway, that find was called the Saddle Ridge Horde, and actually Warren Gettler, who wrote Shadow of the Sentinel, which we're going to be talking about here in a little bit, took a look at it and said, you know what, this is consistent with a Knights of the Golden Circle treasure. And that would explain the huge amount of value ascribed to this particular find, which thankfully they did not clean. <laughs> yeah, you immediately lose – thousands of dollars yeah, in value seven to eight thousand dollars in value if they'd have tried to clean it and there because there is a coin in there at least one that it was minted in i think 1866 that does not say in god we trust on it that right. coin alone is worth several million dollars apparently yeah that motto was added in 1866 and some were minted without that but that not many <laughs> yeah not many but yeah it's like with stamps you're looking for a misprint or something that's unusual what what makes it valuable is its rarity so if it's a mistake or there's a phrase 
or something about the coin that is not common with the rest of the production. Yes. That's what makes it so incredibly valuable. Yeah, and this one would have had to have been minted pretty early in 1866 to have been minted without the phrase because it, yeah. it was there was only a few weeks. There was a small window apparently. So anyway, that's it's pretty amazing. That's probably a KGC cache. And that brings us to the next section of episode two here. Before we continue, we want to take a quick moment to recognize tonight's sponsor, Venice Beach-based online bedding company, Parachute Home. I am loving my new sheets and duvet cover I got from them. Well, I just got mine. I got to say, the whole experience was awesome. The website, first of all, is very straightforward, easy to use. You see exactly what you're getting. And then once you get them, that's also a real treat. From the moment that you open the box, you can really tell, like, this is a handcrafted, well-made product. Packed with care and a handwritten note. It is, I did get it's the handwritten nice, note, yeah. which I believe is, like, handwritten with a, with a felt pen. That's right. And it's like, well, that's kind of cool. It's a nice little personal touch. And just the way that they, they come in a little uh, – it's an outer – uh, sack that is made of the same material with a little drawstring. Yeah. It's all very cool. But b- basically the idea, though, is that you're getting something special. And then once you use them, you realize, yes, you are, because yeah. they're so they're so comfy. I'm and, definitely uh, sleeping better. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know what? Which uh, is nice. Yeah. The, <laughs> the, the downside is that I'm late for work because I don't want to get out of bed now. There's just a level of comfort that they bring. And again, they're they're just well made. And that's what I really appreciate about products, especially nowadays when you get so much stuff that isn't well made. Shop online at parachutehome.com slash ALP and receive $25 off your first order by using the code ASTONISHING. That's right. Get $25 off by entering the code ASTONISHING at checkout on ParachuteHome.com slash ALP. Okay, back to the show. How do you hide all of this money, an entire treasury, enough to start a second civil war, enough to conquer huge swaths of land? How do you hide this? Well, it's not just hiding it, Scott. How do you find it again? We've talked about this before, and I think I mentioned something about, uh, you know, families would do this. And again, talking about coins, when the gold was confiscated or (laughs) suggested that you turn it in in the 30s by the U.S. government, people didn't want to do that. So they hid their coins in jars in the backyard, and they would place little markers like a nail on the underside of a a large tree branch, and then you'd, you'd hang a plumb bob down pointing to the spot in the ground where you should dig. Okay, well, this is a little more sophisticated than a nail in the underside of a tree branch. Yes. Because that's the big thing. And and again, I want to mention this again. A lot of times people who bury things can never find them again because your memory changes, geography changes, erosion happens, things grow. So you need a good, defined, yet secretive code system to be able to find this stuff again. You're adding to that challenge the idea of burying hundreds yeah. <laughs> of items, hundreds of caches, some of them huge, some of them small, all over the United States. Right. All over the the Southwest, the Midwest, Arkansas, all the way to California, and as we'll see, Arizona. It's, it's a lot to do, and it's a lot to keep track of. And whenever you have a project like this, you have to have what I like to call an architect. Yes. And you have to have a mastermind who can come up with a good method for concealing these things from everyday people, but also, as you said, being able to decode and find again when you need it yeah. to do what you had planned to do originally. Well, what you just can't... take over the world. <laughs> yeah, or at least a big chunk of it. Yeah. What you don't want, I would say, is. 30 different methods. Exactly. You need one unifying methodology to plot out where this is buried and find it again when you need it. Fortunately for the Knights of the Golden Circle, some systems had already been invented some time before them, and most of them are credited with our old friend, Sir Francis Bacon. Uh-huh. He's pretty much the most famous architect of concealment in history. His, his intellectual prowess led to the construction of methods of concealing information in plain sight that wound up being the most complete evolution of hidden symbolism that mankind has probably ever seen. And we talked about him a great deal on Oak Island because he is thought to be connected with that. But And we'll come back to that in a minute. But Bacon's systems for hiding this information are so effective, it is the foundation upon which Masonic secrets have been kept from his time moving forward. He was such a big influence that the Masons adopted a lot of his methodologies in terms of ciphers and symbolism to conceal things. When we come around to the Knights of the Golden Circle, we have to talk about a man known as Albert Pike, who we mentioned in part one. Pike was the architect of the KGC Treasury Vaults 
concealment. He was a 33rd degree Scottish Rite Mason, pretty much the founder of Scottish Rite Masonry in North America. Well, yes. I would say also, though, specifically the Southern jurisdiction. So there were high-ranking Masons, of course. And yes. again, I wanted to point this out because even my dad was, uh, was kind of blown away by this. Think about this. The Union administrated out of Washington, D.C., is not really fond of putting up Confederate soldier statues. Yes. There are only two. And again, this is important to show how connected this guy was. The first one is Robert E. Lee. The second and only other statue is Albert Pike. Yes. Whom a lot of people have not heard of, but apparently important enough to, get, to warrant a statue. In, in D.C. Our, in our nation's capital. Yes. On the side of the Union in the North. Also, he was one of the primary leaders of the Southern Secessionists, and he had a penchant for complex rituals and symbology. He was perfectly aligned to lay out a network of hundreds of underground financial depositories through the use of sacred geometry and things that he had learned in masonry. And he was also fascinated with Native American culture. And he had aligned with multiple tribes that, believe it or not, had interest in the Confederacy's goals, mostly because they were pretty ticked off still about having their land taken from them. And right. in some cases, it's thought that maybe Pike or Confederates had said to them, look, if you help this cause with the Civil War, we'll give you your own state. You can have some of your territory back. And, and he was very friendly with, with many of them. And some of these – some of the Native American tribes actually were involved in slavery as well. And you have to keep in mind a lot of these – Native American tribal leaders became wealthy and had land, and some of them were military leaders, like General Standwati. Yes. Who was the last general to surrender, right? Yes, the last Confederate general to surrender. He was a Native American general. Pike knew a lot about a lot of things, and he had friends in a lot of places, and hiding the KGC treasury was the perfect place for him to use Masonic tricks of the trade, all derivative of Sir Francis Bacon's development, most notably cryptic symbolism, double entendre, sacred geometry, hidden messages that you could make through the way that you wrote text by intentional errors, all this kind of stuff that came up a great deal in the Oak Island show. And one thing that you don't see in, in Sir Francis Bacon's time is that now as photography is coming into play, a lot of figures that are posing for photographs are imbuing them with coded gestures, yes. messages, objects. Secret hand symbols. Yeah. Yes. In fact, there's a famous picture of John Quitman, who was a senior level KGC operative. And a very high ranking Mason. And a very high ranking Mason on horseback. We have the picture on our website, actually where he's on horseback and you see on the blanket under the saddle down in the corner, you see the crescent moon and the star. You see exact KGC symbol. It's hidden in the painting in plain sight. Yeah. Signs like that are prevalent in many, many pictures and portraits and photographs of a lot of these men who were controlling figures in the Knights of the Golden Circle. It's a message to those who know. You have to be initiated. Yes. Which is going to come up a lot here as, as we continue explaining where we're going next with this. Now, one of the things that we've learned from doing as many shows as we've done now on Lost Treasures and the people and the mysteries that surround them and their swirling aftermath is that as there were these great architects of concealment involved in their construction, as time passes, the universe restores balance and it produces someone with almost an unnatural gift for solving those impossible riddles. An uninitiated person who somehow figures it out anyway. In reality, can rival some of the most famous tales of all time, such as Robert de Boron's poem Merlin, which tells us only he who was fit to rule England would be able to withdraw the sword Excalibur from a stone. Or in more modern times, Neo from The Matrix. <laughs> He's the chosen one. <laughs> He's the chosen one, and yeah. he must believe in his destiny as a messiah in order to succeed. And when the right person takes on a mission to unravel a great mystery from a righteous place in their heart, they are often seemingly protected by a higher, undefinable power. And somehow they can easily apprehend things that other people can't. One of my favorite examples of this is someone who we've come to know through Oak Island, Petter Amundsen, who is the church organist from Norway, who actually just had a book released last month. It's called The Seven Steps to Mercy, with Shakespeare's key to the Oak Island Templum. History has yet to prove whether Petter's going to be right about Oak Island, but so far, all things being equal, my money is on him. I don't know where you come down for us, but I think if even if he's off the mark, it's hard to imagine that he's not in the ballpark with what's going on there. Well, you know what it takes, and I think this is what Petter has, is uh, a lot of brains and an open heart and a dedication to the material. And a lot of these people, what happens is that you find one little clue that gets you interested, and then that leads to another one, that leads to another one. 
And then you dedicate a lot of your life to unraveling these clues. And whether you believe where, you know, where he's going or not, or who wrote what or not, uh, I believe he's found some very undeniably interesting things. Yes. Within, I mean, within old texts and using known methods that have been proven that, again, he's found some really fascinating connections. Yes, he has. And I, so I would really recommend checking his book out, by the way. And I, I believe he's going to be having a, a film coming out soon as well. So uh, it's, it's definitely worth looking into if you're interested in this kind of stuff. And also, Petter, you should be listening to this episode because this <laughs> what's yeah. about to happen here is, is right up your alley. Well, the other part of it, too, is that it's a, it's a kind of a different branch. There's a literary aspect to finding this out because if you make these connections, it changes the course of what we know about the history of literature and politics and human development. And then there's the other aspect of finding the material things which these codes have hidden. The other thing that happens that we've learned just from doing our show is that a lot of times, whether it's Oak Island or even the Amelia Earhart episodes and the people that have the different hypotheses about what happened to her, greed comes into the picture. It clouds judgment. There's there's infighting. There's ego. There's, there's a lot of things that can make things more complicated. As a result of that, clues are often lost or obliterated. Confirmation bias clouds facts. People work against each other often closed off to approaches that don't align with theirs. But no matter what, though, sooner or later, that person comes along, like Petter has done with Oak Island. And tonight we're going to talk about a man who seems to have solved the riddles of the lost treasury of the Knights of the Golden Circle. Much of the information that follows comes from years of tedious research presented in the book Shadow of the Sentinel, which was written by a former Wall Street journalist and investigative journalist named Warren Gettler and Bob Brewer who the book is about. The book came out in 2008. It is pretty mind-blowing. Frankly, I couldn't recommend it enough. If you're into this, these last two episodes of our show at all, this book is a must-read, and you can get to it um, from our website if you want. There's a link there. When we actually get a little kickback if you buy it through there, but you can also just go to Amazon and pick it up because it is a little, it being the operative word, kickback. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, Scott could use those four sets yeah, for exactly. equipment purchases <laughs> and memory cards. Yeah, and, and that book actually was also reprinted a few years later under the title Rebel Gold, but the two texts, as far as I can tell, are pretty much identical. Yeah, you might find it, especially in paperback form, as Rebel Gold. Yes. But it's essentially the same book, same information. In this book, Gettler tells the story of what I will say is Masonic treasure cache coding savant Bob Brewer and how he came to discover multiple caches of KGC gold. Bob is a very unassuming man. He was born in Arkansas into a family that had been in the area for a long time. And I guess at this point we should talk a little bit about his great uncle, who yeah, everyone well, called Grandpa, right. Ashcraft. Yes, he comes from a family of self-taught mountain men, which I think he would describe as himself, as somebody who knows the backwoods and the ways of life very well and uh, has survived for, for hundreds of years now. He has a very large extended family in Polk County, Arkansas, at the base of the Washita Mountains. And so he's grown up with his uncles and relatives hunting and fishing and timbering and doing a little prospecting. This is where he's from. He's born and bred of this area. And his father's sister, Bessie, was married to a gentleman named Otis Ashcraft. Yes. Who they called Uncle Odie. Yes. Now, Uncle Odie's father was William Ashcraft, and they called him Grandpa. He was a man in his early 70s at the time when uh, Bob was a kid. Right. But from these two, they took a liking to each other as kinfolk, and they were teaching him the ways of the back country. Yes. How to get around, how to, uh, how to track game, how to farm, all those great things uh, that Bob you know, grew up enjoying. And along the way, it seems Uncle Odie and Grandpa would drop little clues. Yeah, they would often say, hey, you know, look at that tree over there. See those markings on that tree? That's a treasure tree. If you could read those markings, you can find more gold than you could ever dream of. Yeah. And, and then that's – but that's all they would say. Just right. a little bit, little dips and dollops of information spread out over the course of years. Yeah, and what the purpose of that is, as Bob says, is that they are possibly being slowly groomed. He and his two brothers – as, as each outing would, would happen, they would maybe see a tree and Grandpa would say, take a look at the markings on that tree. And if you can find out what that means, you might find something. Not that he's going to tell them how to do that, right. but it would, it would be something like that. And of course, the kids were very curious. It's like, well, what does Grandpa and Uncle Odie mean? Well, they're very slowly over the process of years, 
kind of letting them in on the secret, you could say. That's right. And, and But also kind of testing their mettle. Are these boys worthy of this knowledge and the sacred duty that we may hand down to them as, as we get older? That's right. And Grandpa, as they called him, Ashcraft, he was pretty famous within the family for pretty much never being home. <laughs> well, yeah, he'd take off and go into the woods with his almost rifle, every day. Yeah. With his rifle every day, he was gone. And he would say, apparently, according to the lore in the family, he would say he had to go out hunting cows. Which Bob found unusual because there were very, very few cows on the property. And this is a very tiny town called Hatfield, about 90 miles west of Hot Springs, Arkansas. Right. And, and you know, I think Grandpa even lived maybe 10 miles further uh, into the woods uh, near Brushy Creek. So it's not really ranching area, but that was his excuse. Gettler and Brewer in their book mentioned that cow might be short for cowan which is a Masonic term, which I actually looked up from uh, Reverend Dr. John Jameson's Scottish Dictionary. Mm. Here's the following meanings of the word Cowan. There's three of them. One, a term of contempt applied to one who does the work of a Mason, but has not been regularly bred. Two, also used to denote one who builds dry walls, otherwise denominated a dry diker. Three, one unacquainted with the secrets of Freemasonry. So now we got this word that is Scottish in origin and belongs specifically to the Masons. The question is, was Grandpa Ashcraft using it in that way? You really can't tell, right? Because that's the, the and that's what coming back to the beauty of how the KGC works and how the system works. Nothing is said literally. There are codes, there are nicknames, there's double entendres for everything. The system is like perfect in its ability to conceal. No one blatantly tells you anything. Right. Well, <laughs> it's like, yeah, you have to realize the setup as well. These guys don't work at the NSA and leave all the secrets at the building when they go home for the day. Yeah. They live amongst these people, and their relatives knew, don't ask too many questions. Uh, Bob, used, as a boy, used to sit on Grandpa's old trunk, and uh, he would ask Grandma, like, well, what's in there? He's like, you know what? I don't ask, and you shouldn't either. That's, That's right. Grandpa's stuff. Yes. Don't bother with it. And he wouldn't learn for many years later what was really in there. That's right. And to further point out the sophistication of the Knights of the Golden Circle, in fact, if you go back, and I think we mentioned, we, we talked a little bit about this in part one. If you look at the original leader of the Knights of the Golden Circle, George Washington Lafayette Bickley, who was the pre-Civil War leader of the group, the one who we mentioned was arrested for spying, he was largely seen as kind of incompetent. Like, he was, he was a really good a propagandist. <laughs> yeah but a little bit incompetent. and Well, you wouldn't want to trust him with your money because he was a little bit of money trouble himself personally before this all happened. But what they say is that he could whip people up, as we said in, in, in part yes. one. He could get uh, people fired up, which is what they needed. Uh, they needed uh, – he knew how to incite strong feelings in favor of the cause, and he knew how to get at the Southern Sympathizer – newspaper editors of the time yeah. and kind of position uh, story articles or lines of thought. But his lack of competence may have had another goal for the true power behind the Knights of the Golden Circle who were backstage, for lack of a better word. Yeah. And in fact, in Shadow of the Sentinel, Gettler and Brewer quote historian I. Winslow Iyer, author of The Great Northwestern Conspiracy, as saying that in 1865, KGC leaders, quote, put forward the most irresponsible persons at their command as the mouthpieces and official representatives of the order to the end that if detected, the theory of crazy powerless fools could be wielded upon public sentiment by an undisturbed partisan press to save the scheme from thorough investigation and development by the authorities, end quote. So they were intentionally, that's how sophisticated they were. They are intentionally putting people out front that it's, if you if you saw them and like, oh, that guy, there's no way he's part of anything real. Well, think about it today. If you were proposing some kind of grand conspiracy, you're looked upon as a nut. Exactly. And, and, and all of the, the crazy things like what? You're going you're gonna to separate the half of the union and start your own thing? That's crazy. Well, it's Kaiser Soze. The biggest yeah. trick the devil ever pulled was convincing people he didn't exist. He didn't exist or he didn't have plans for secession. Yes. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but this is not so far-fetched because we have – this is going on today in Southern California here. There's people who want, it, who want the valley – as a separate city from Los Angeles. That's right. There's people who want to separate Northern California from Southern California because what it comes down to is the way people live and what they believe in. And as human beings, we believe we are of a like mind with the people that live around us. And if people don't agree with you, well, they're from somewhere else. We don't want to be associated with them politically. Yes. 
So yeah, that happens quite a bit. So even in Texas, there's thoughts of secession to this day. Let's separate ourselves uh, geographically, politically, and and you know, birds of a feather are going to flock together. So let's make that happen. Well put. Okay. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, we, we, di- we digress. We digress. Yeah. Get back yeah. to Bob Brewer. Okay. Right. So Brewer grew up learning all this stuff. He learned about all this symbolism that, 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 you, that you would see on these trees and on rocks. There would be horses, snakes, turtles, spirals, birds, turkey tracks, cryptic lettering, and dates. And, and having been told there was more money buried than you can spend, he would say, you know, why, why can't we dig this? We need this money. Why can't we dig this? And he, Ashcroft, would say, Ashcroft would say to him, it's not ours. It belongs to someone else. So that in itself explains the whole idea behind the guarding of this money. Right. Well, what you find funny is the things that Uncle Odie and Grandpa said were kind of teasing and contradictory because they would say like, well, you know, if you could figure that out, you could gain a lot of money. But then they would say like, well, don't do that, though. Yes. (laughs) So maybe this was their plan is to kind of inspire intense curiosity Within the boys. And I think out of the three sons, Bob was probably the most intensely curious. Yes. And maybe the closest to, to Uncle Odie and, uh, and Grandpa. Well, and like Petter, he has a gift for understanding how this stuff all works together. Well, Compiling you know, information and... Yeah, exactly. No, I know people who can look at the word jumble in the, in the newspaper, the, you know, <laughs> in the past years and instantly know what it is. Yeah. That's not for everybody. I, I certainly can't do that. Right. But there's some people who can, who can look at that and see the message come through. Right. As Bob gets older and he starts to learn about this and he starts to become convinced that there's actually money hidden in the woods around the land where he lives and his family lives and all through the area... He initially kind of thinks, oh, this must be like Spanish treasure. There must be money out here. He's not, he's not putting together where the money came from. He starts to discover this language of hieroglyphics that's kind of the same. It's popping up over and over on different trees where there will be – and a lot of times the symbols are exactly eye level for a person who would be on horseback. Ah, see. But he's not too far off because a lot of uh, the Spanish gold that was discovered in the mid-1500s, yes. they did use coding like that. And it was this kind of the same symbology. That's right. So these aren't just made up out of nowhere. And also you can't have 200 of them. <laughs> you need a certain a set amount of these differing symbols that each mean something specific. That's and right. They're, and they're directional. But yeah, the Spanish did it as well. And the other thing that he kept finding and seeing, and this is pretty fascinating, were trees that had been grafted grafted limbs where the trees like grew in super weird shapes. One Gettler describes in the book as looking like football uprights. Yeah. And this is a complex process, grafting, and it takes time to do and you and it takes it's a skill set that you have to learn to learn how to do it, which Bob said his family knew how to do. The other thing to think about with grafting is it's something that's going to last a long time. If the tree lives to be a hundred years old or whatever, it's it's something you can leave behind that's still going to be there even after the people who did it are dead and gone. When you're out in the woods and you come across the tree that looks like it's been grafted, you have to stop and think, you know, maybe you should look. Maybe it's got some <laughs> symbols on it. It might be a good place to dig dig a little bit. Yeah. Again, though, you could spend hours, days, years, your whole lifetime digging in the wrong spot. That's true. Uh, but what you're saying, though, is like what we mentioned uh, previously, is that you need something that with some permanence. Trees do die and blow over, and rocks get covered with moss and this and that. But if you have a general pattern and then... You know to look upon this pattern and then look for signs within the pattern. Yes. That makes it cohesive. Right. And that's exactly what he he really excelled at, at finding that stuff. He started to figure out as he got older, you know, Ashcraft passed away. And unfortunately, Uncle Odie <laughs> died oh, yeah. uh, prematurely well, before he could impart all the rest of the wisdom about how and why and what your duties would be as a guard of these treasure caches, he was killed in a logging accident. Yeah, a tree fell on him. Ironically is that, you know, growing up, they were used to hand saws and the ways of old in the woods. And it was the noise of the chainsaw kept him from hearing this tree falling. Yes. Uh, But what they were doing is in the middle of this was grooming Bob to inherit these secrets, these family traditions and secrets. And unfortunately, they passed away before they could complete the job. All right, so Bob is is growing up now. He's getting older, and he's starting to get super interested in this stuff. And he starts digging around and finding things buried in the ground. He finds, like, axe heads, horses bits, this kind of stuff. And it's buried just under the dirt. You can't see it. So the question is, how did they find it originally? And right. it turns out you had to have a Spanish dip needle compass. And you would sort of have to get down near the ground 
So you would already need to know where you needed to be looking. Right. And for every unit of distance that you double away from the item, the weakness of the signal is increased by eight times. Yeah. So you got to kind of be down there. You got to know what you're looking for. This is indicative of how the whole system works. If you don't know where to look, you're not going to see anything. Imagine it this way. There's no one clue that's going to tell you X marks the spot. Exactly. One clue leads to the next clue. Right. Because it's not meant to be gotten easily. So a lot of these things, if you if you found an iron metal object buried underground that you were meant to find, a lot of times the purpose is, is a direction. A, an old rusted pistol or rifle was pointed in a certain direction for That's you to right. go. A, a plow point was pointed in a certain direction meant to guide you. That's right. You but didn't... it's not directly over the treasure itself. You know what I'm saying? So, That's yeah. right. You yeah. didn't touch it until you documented what it was indicating. And a lot of times with Bob, when he found something, he would put it back. Yes. Because yeah. that's part of it as well. Oh, you yeah. start removing things, you're deconstructing the system. You never know if you're ever going to be able to find it again, as you pointed out earlier in this in this episode. Right. Eventually, in 1991, he was out with his wife, Linda, who thought he was crazy. I mean, she knew that he was seeing stuff on <laughs> yeah. trees, but he hadn't found anything. So it's kind of like, is this all in your head? There was not really – I don't think – it's not really said in the book, but I, I, I don't think Bob was necessarily aware of the Knights of the Golden Circle. And – so in 1991, he and his wife actually found a jar of coins, and it was the first time he had found something, and he knew at that point that he was uncovering a system that he could understand. Yeah, the coding worked, or the decoding worked. Yes, yeah. and it also meant something the, – the real revelation was that all of these symbols that are everywhere, if they all lead to, at the very least, a jar of coins, there is a ton to be found out here. Yeah. There's no way that he can turn back now. He's interested in solving all the riddles of the symbols and how they all work together. I was going to say as well that uh, what Bob is turning into here, it's a little bit of the gold bug in that once you find something, it ramps you up and he's becoming a treasure hunter. And that is a lifestyle. Yes. That is not, it's not for everyone because, again, you're away from your family quite a bit. You're out tromping around in the remote parts of uh, the country that Bob is kind of slowly being pulled into. Yes. And it, but it's important to add that Bob is very measured as well. Yes. And because he, throughout the course of his life in different investigations of different areas, he did wind up partnering up with other folks. There was one school teacher who, you know, because other people, Bob didn't have the corner on the market with respect to KGC gold. There were other people that were figuring out that there were symbols and treasures hidden out in the countryside. And more often than not, they would come to him and take advantage of him in a way, which he wasn't really prepared for. And he wound up getting cheated out of yeah. a few significant fines by some unscrupulous people. Right. And it took a while for him to realize that that, that was probably going to happen over and over again. Because like you said, he did have he did have the gold bug, but he was never the crazy I gotta go now and get it, I gotta get no. it, you know, at all yeah, yeah. at all possible costs. No, it's how he was raised, to be respectful. Yes. And to observe tradition and to be an upstanding citizen with this other further cause below the surface, literally. But he wasn't that kind of guy who's just out to rob his friends and steal cash. Basically, a lot of it is the cash, the coins, the treasures, that's a bonus to really the intellectual pursuit of decoding this whole system because it's part of your history that as he's grown up. It's a part of American history. And and again, the bonus is like, well, you could uh, you could walk away somewhat wealthy. That's right. In one case, he got wrapped up with this guy and he had uh, – a map came into his possession that what he called the wolf map that someone found at Buzzard's Roost hidden in a rusty old kettle that was buried. And Buzzard's Roost was a known hideout for Jesse James. Mm -hmm. I don't know which one, but he had several. <laughs> one of the, one of the, no, but I mean, which Jesse James? Oh, <laughs> that's correct. Yeah, yeah. Well, either one or all. Of them. If you believe there's more than one. Yeah, but there was a, there was a stagecoach line as as the stagecoach went in between Arkansas and into uh, Oklahoma. That uh, you know, what is the stage carrying? Payroll, Payroll, money. Yeah. So it was an easy way to rob something, be a highwayman, literally, and then disappear into the woods. That's right. Yeah. Bob did a lot of work on this wolf map kind of decoding it and figuring out where they thought a big cash might be. And when I talk about a lot of work, I'm talking about a thousand hours of work 
just buried in his room, trying to figure out how all the symbols work together, the tangents, drawing maps, doing templates and overlays on maps. It's very complex. We're going all the way back to Albert Pike and sort of the Masonic designs that he put into the concealment of all this stuff. Bob is having to reverse engineer that with no knowledge of masonry or sacred geometry beyond what he learned painting airplanes in the Navy because he had to (laughs) paint like this emblem on the side of the airplane that you had to uh, box a circle for. And that that was like his exposure to these patterns. Weirdly, that helped him a great deal in terms of discovering how things were laid out in these maps. Yeah, you have to set your mind to it uh, and, and start thinking in those modes. You And, and again, somebody, there's a quote you wrote down, these clues aren't going to help you unless you get into the mind of the person creating them. Right. Is that you start to have to think like the person who's designing this, and then you have to have the tools and the developed knowledge to decipher it. And as you were saying, Bob is getting the thrill of discovery into his veins here. Yes. He's an adventurous sort. He was a helicopter crew chief in the Navy during the Vietnam years. And when he got out, of course, uh, here's another adventure. He is the man for the job. And more often than not, when you read the book, what you find out is that everyone else who thinks they're on the trail of it is only 20 or 30 percent on it until they meet Bob. And then- <laughs> right. Then they find out, they stand back, mouth agape at the information that he spews almost immediately when he gets brought into a search that someone else is already working on. And in this particular case with the wolf map, he was involved with a gentleman who took advantage of him. And they determined that this cache was on private land. And they wanted to get on there, and Bob wanted to do the right thing and contact the rancher that owned the land and get permission to go on there and look for the cash, which is uh, typical in treasure hunting. If you're playing by the book, you do this, and you offer a cut to the landowner. Yeah. I think legally you have to nowadays if if you're above board. Yes, exactly. So Bob says to his partner, well, why don't you get in touch with the rancher, and as soon as we get permission, we'll go on there. And they they retreat back to their respective homes because this was not near where they lived. The partner keeps saying, oh, I can't get in touch with him. It's like six months go by. Bob's like, what is going on with the rancher? Let's We got to get out there. And he's like, I can't get in touch with him. I don't know what's going on. Bob finally starts to get suspicious. He goes out there, and he goes to where they think the cash is or was, and finds that it's been, that a giant hole's been dug and it's gone. And on top of that, the partner seems to have come into a great deal of money. Uh, do, you, do you know how much, uh, relatively? N- no, the partner told Bob what, how much he found, but yeah. he, of course, exaggerated it downward. Sure. <laughs> of course, yeah. And, and on top of that, had the gall to sort of say, you know, I can't wait to work with you again. Oh, geez. That's what you do, of course, is that, uh, well, we're, we're cool, right? Like, yeah. We'll, we'll just keep doing this and you can help me out. But you know what Bob did was he turned him into the rancher because he had gone without permission. So yeah. He, no, as he should have done, because yeah. again, you're on people's property that they own. They are entitled to that legally as well. But uh, imagine imagine putting a thousand hours of work into deciphering this map that pretty much no one else in the world could yeah. do except for maybe Petter Amundsen. Yeah. <laughs> right. and, then, and, and then finding out that you've been betrayed and all that work just is down the tubes and you've, you're basically starting over with a different search somewhere else. Well, now we're back to National Treasure and Sean Bean and the first one. Right. Coming, swooping in, knowing that he's onto something, but this is a guy that is going to figure it out for me because we're criminals and we're lazy. So, <laughs> yeah. But that's what, that's what usually happens is somebody with the brains figures it out and uh, they may not always have the wherewithal to go retrieve it. And, uh, and Bob grew up not with people like that, you know, who were untrustworthy. So Right. So Bob wound up getting ripped off by this unscrupulous partner. And one of the things that's really interesting, like if you want to know the level of deduction that he is doing when he's working on these maps, aside from a lot of cryptic symbols on the wolf map, which you can see in the book, Shadow of the Sentinel or Rebel Gold. You need to get a copy of that book if you, if you like this story. But one of the things that you can see in there is the letters I and C. No one would know what IC meant. Bob figured out that IC referred to Indian camp. Indian camp referred to the Kiowa Comanche territory, and that allowed him to pinpoint the exact geographic location that the wolf map applied to. It's that kind of thing. If you saw the letters I and C on a map and you were trying to figure all this stuff out, what are the odds that you would ever put that together? Yeah, you, you know, have to know the history. You have, you have to know to the study. history of the area. You have to know a whole lot of things. And Bob knew all those things, and that partner took advantage of him, who was a school teacher, no less. Oh, 
<laughs> yeah. um, so, and I don't even want to say his name. I yeah. don't believe in. I don't yeah. want to give any fame to that guy, but it, it, it's 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 disappointing. And hey, greed you know. makes you do crazy things, but you know what? You have to start off or at least turn greedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Bob, Bob got pretty upset after this. He withdrew, according to the book. Yeah, he got kind of depressed because again, it's a lot of work, all for nothing. Somebody swoops in and takes your prize. Bob's not out of the game yet, though, because a well-funded and well-organized group is on the trail of something big in Arizona. The Lost Dutchman Mine, a legend so famous that it is said over 8,000 treasure hunters a year go looking for it. In spite of the fact that in excess of 30 people have been found murdered since 1847 in the Superstition Mountains, where the mine is rumored to be located, many of them decapitated. Thank you so much for joining us again for tonight's show. We'll be back in two weeks or possibly less with our last show of this year and part three of the KGC, An American Conspiracy. Our theme was composed by Judson Crane and our sound design by Ryan McCullough. Special thanks to Tess Feifel for managing our research department. Most importantly, we want to thank our listeners. You can find us online at astonishinglegends.com as well as Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and Google+. Copyright Scott Philbrook and Forrest Burgess. Good night. <laughs>